Okay, welcome back to uh, uh, this talk. Um, I changed the title a little bit. I think I will emphasize here more the two-dimensional theories, the results which you got the last uh, year. So this was a collaboration with uh, Daniel August, who just did his PhD thesis, and uh, Björn Wellegehausen, a senior postdoc in my group. Um, so I will a little bit discuss for those who are not that familiar with, uh, uh, so we have heard a lot about it, is the reduction from two to two, or to two dimensions, it's just essential steps, and emphasizing, of course, the symmetries, which are then relevant for the discussion. Then I will present the lattice formulation, which we use in our simulations. And then I will show you results about the water entities, and in particular, of the mass spectrum of the theory. So we focus in our simulation not so much on the thermodynamic behavior or on the phases, but on the mass spectrum of the theory. And as far as I know, nobody has looked into that so far. So it may be useful uh, later on for other people to compare uh, with this result. So this is a four-dimensional uh, super young mills theory in the continuum formulation. Uh, you have seen it, I guess, several times now. And uh, let me stress this gamma matrices in four dimensions, since I will discuss the dimensional reductions, are uh, denoted by capital gamma. And uh, of course, you have here the field strengths of squared, the young mills term. And then again, important is lambda is a Majorana, represent, uh, Majorana particle to match the degrees of freedom. And uh, both are, of course, in the same multiplet. That means both are in the joint representation. And I also, for completeness, wrote down the simple supersymmetry <coughs> formation rules. Now, uh, this theory has an axial uh, symmetry, which I wrote here again. And this is broken in, the, in four dimensions. I mentioned it already uh, by anomaly to this discrete group, and then in a the second step by a condensate to set two. So that's the situation roughly about the breaking mechanism in four dimensions. Now let's shortly discuss the dimensional reduction. So we, uh, well, we don't have to, but it's convenient to use a particular representation, and the convenient one is the one given here. So I decompose the four-dimensional gammas in this way, where the three-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, two-dimensional gammas appear here. That's just a convenient choice where you immediately get a nice form of the two-dimensional action. Well, you have to worry a little bit about the charge conjugation because we're talking about Majorana fermions. This representation, the four-dimensional charge conjugation goes essentially into two-dimensional charge conjugation. And the gamma five uh, goes almost into the gamma five up to this uh, sigma two here. The second factor will then be the two-dimensional theory, the uh, acting on the Lorentz indices, and the first acting on the two flavor indices you get by the dimensional reduction. So now you reduce the Young-Mills term. The, this term everybody probably has seen many, many times. You get the Young-Mills term. You get the uh, kinetic term for the uh, two scalar fields. So that's the dimensional, the four-dimensional gauge potential becomes the two-dimensional gauge potential, two scalar fields in the joint. And then you get this unavoidable uh, potential in theory with uh, extended supersymmetry with uh, the problem of the flat directions. Of course, I will discuss the flat directions later on. The fermionic part decomposes in this way. Um, <clears throat> okay, I keep seeing the notation. This is still the four-dimensional Majorana. If you want, you can further reduce it to two-dimensional two, two -dimensional Majoranas, two-component Majoranas, and go to the Dirac basis. And then this theory in Minkowski's basis has this uh, form. So you, we get what you had before, the Amils term. We get the Dirac term. But in addition, we get now this, these two scalar fields uh, with this typical potential here. And then here we have Yukawa interaction. So that is the model. We are talking about the continuum version of the model in the Dirac notation. You may think that we have one complex or two real scalar fields. We have one Dirac or two Majorana spinners, everything now in two dimensions and irreducible representations. And we have the usual Young Mills and uh, kinetic term for the fermions. What happens to the symmetry? If you start with a Lorentz uh, symmetry, it becomes a Lorentz symmetry in two dimensions plus a R symmetry, which of course rotates uh, fermions, in this case the scalars and the supercharges. Um, so what happens, um, okay. what happens under this, uh, you know, this R symmetry? And this R symmetry, this uh, complex scalar field rotates with a phase but the fermion, because of this identification here, they need a gamma 5 to come from the Majorana to the Dirac, 
uh, what dates now with the chiral transformation. So the R symmetry, at least in this formulation, uh, is just a chiral transformation. On the other hand, if you take the chiral symmetry in four dimensions, it becomes a phase rotation. So it is an exchange, so to say, an interchange of symmetries in this reduction. So again, it's low in symmetry becomes low in symmetry plus chiral symmetry. The chiral symmetry becomes a global phase rotation in two dimensions. So now here I flash the uh, expected spectrum in, of this two-dimensional theory. So we know, we think we know what is a spectrum in four dimensions, at least of the low-lying states. That is two multiplets, uh, which I also mentioned in my previous talk. Uh, both are chiral multiplets. So now you reduce these two multiplets, and what you end up is, uh, is a multiplets. Uh, the, op the intertwining operators are written here. Interpolating operators are written here. So it's uh, a A and a joint eta and a joint F particle, glu gluino glue ball, a gluino scalar ball. This should be probably one multiplet. And the second multiplet would be, uh, you know, this particle glue, glue ball and so on. Actually, I have to say much more be about this multiplet, uh, we'll see later on, the masses, than this one, which seem to decouple. They have, uh, that's what the simulation tells us. So in the continuum, um, we have water identities, and we use also water identities on the lattice to check how close we are to the supersymmetric limit. So um, if you take this operator, and takes its Q variation, at least if you have a supersymmetric T in the continuum, this should be zero's expectation value if supersymmetry is not broken. And you can decompose this now into three terms according to the structure of the indices, whether this is a space-time index and a flavor index, or, well, you have three combinations, space-time, space-time, uh, flavor, flavor, and space-time, flavor. So you get then three operators, and to these three operators, you have three order identities. Okay? And the so sum of these three word identities is a word identity which you usually use in four dimensions, which is just the, uh, essentially the, which most people use. Uh, and you can argue that the expectation value of W1 must be, in a, in a supersymmetric limit, must be zero. That's an analytic result. W2 must be three half. W3 is three. If you add them up, you get the usual bosonic word identity which you use in four dimensions. And for SU2, they should add up to nine divided by two. So that's a check. We have now three word identities which you can check. Well, we have, of course, infinitely many, but these are uh, useful ones. Uh, it's more sensitive than the one you have in, in four dimensions. So let me show not too much about the super, uh, super uh, the lattice formulation because it's a naive discretization by Wilson fermions. But um, Sorry, so you have scalars, so you have classically you have flat directions. Uh, so do you have a quantum moduli space or not? Yes, but can you wait? Can you? I will, of course, tell about this important issue. Okay, Make I thought the way. moment you move to lattice, uh, <laughs> you. I have to worry, as you have heard in many, many talks about this flat direction. Okay. Whether they are lifted or not. I come to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we have a direct approach. We lose a. Uh, 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 Wilson fermions, so the lattice then breaks uh, all, supersymmetry, all supersymmetry. And I should also introduce that uh, we, are, we have to introduce a counter term because phi squared is a relevant operator, also in two dimensions. Um, and this has been actually calculated by Suzuki in one loop order uh, with the supersymmetric version of the model, with the Q-exact version. And he calculated in one loop uh, this term. Now, we had to redo this calculation with Wilson fermions, and it turned out there were two cancellations uh, between a change of measure and the different version of the action. It exactly cancels, so we got exactly the same result also for these uh, Wilson fermions. This is the continuum value of this counter term. And it's sufficient to take this one loop result because the theory is super, super randomizable. Now, the fermion mass enters the lattice word identity, also there is no fine-tuning for the fermion mass. Psi by psi is an irrelevant operator in two dimensions. Uh, we still don't put it to zero, which we could do. We optimize it for each lat on each lattice to minimize the supersymmetry breaking uh, terms. So we introduce this additional term to speed up the conversions to the supersymmetric limit. So we use uh, Wilson-Fermions, the three-level improved Lusher-Weiss action. 
and uh, the here I wrote down the fermionic operator. And the important point is, of course, this UA is in a joint representation of the gauge group, and the simulation will be for SU2. So these are rotation matrices, uh, SO3 matrices, and FA is just the matrix consisting of the structure constants of SU2, the antisymmetric epsilon. So this is the, the fermionic action which we, uh, which we will use in our simulations. Then we have the partition functions, uh, because uh, I should also say, in the simulation, we use a four-dimensional formulation. It's just, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit easier to program than the two-dimensional, but it's the same, of course. Just reshuffling the, the vectors, so to say. Okay, so that's why I wrote here the Pfaffian of, uh, um, of this uh, fermionic operator, charge conjugation times this operator, then the determinant, and uh, of course, the usual exponential vector. So I took out the sign of the Pfaffian here. Now, in this theory, because it's a dimensional reduction from four dimensions, it has been proven, and this holds also, of course, in two dimensions, uh, that the eigenvalue of this one are real, first of all, it's, and, but it's a double degenerate. Using continuity in the hopping parameter, you can then show that uh, uh, the Pfaffian is just a product of the eigenvalues, uh, where the determinant is the eigenvalue squared, because each eigenvalue is double degenerate. So it's, in a naive way, you can take the square root. Um, okay. So now we have done here a, a com, uh, you know, okay. Uh, let's study a little bit the design of the Pfaffian. Okay. Um, so how, how did you do that? So we have we took a, a typical uh, configuration at the given beta. So beta is of course the inverse coupling constant squared, essentially kappa is a hopping parameter. And then what we do, so we take configuration belonging to this ensemble given by beta and kappa, and then we vary the kappa, the hopping parameter inside of the Dirac operator. So for kappa equals zero, we know it's a free Dirac operator, the Pfaffian is one or something like that. It's, uh, it can be calculated. And then you just follow the, uh, the eigenvalues or uh, if, you, if you increase kappa, right? So on the left, you start with kappa equals zero. And here you end up with a kappa which uh, was used to produce the ensemble, the one we are really interested in. So here are the, shown the, the lowest, I think, eight eigenvalues in modulus. And you see that goes to this point, and there's still a clear gap at the kappa where you do your simulations. We have repeated this experiment several times, and this is a, a conclusion. Again, here is shown a you know, sort of a Monte Carlo time, gauge configuration, uh, so that there's a certain um, um, kappa. I think I wrote it here, yes, that the, the smallest kappa, kappa increases, and here's a critical kappa, um, which we used in the simulations. And again, you see there's no, no sign problem at all. We never encountered any sign problem for kappa below the critical kappa, I should say. There's a critical kappa. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's gamma 5 symmetric. Yeah. That's why I had the doubling, of course, of the eigenvalues. Yeah. Okay, now if kappa is above the critical kappa, which we will determine later, uh, so the critical kappa is the one where we are as close to supersymmetry as we can be on the finite lattice, then we have something like every thousand configuration, maybe one or two negative eigenvalues. Okay. So different volumes, we check that gauge capping hopping parameter, so the sign of the Pfaffian, uh, we never encountered any negative Pfaffian for kappa, less than kappa critical, really. Not one out of millions which we looked at, so there maybe there's something to prove, but it's of course also a dynamical question, obviously. Um, whereas, as I mean, one in thousand if you go above the critical coupling. Now, let's come to flat. So, there is no, uh, at least in, in the regime, we will, we will simulate below kappa critical. We will approach the critical kappa from below. There is no sign problem. We can do safely our simulations. Let's talk about flat directions. So, uh, as I mentioned, there's this scalar potential. Uh, Okay, which has these uh, flat directions, of course. Uh, but remember, we have to introduce this mass term, this counter term. Uh, I mentioned it, this was been calculated in one loop uh, to come to the supersymmetric limit. Uh, so we did it, uh, and uh, so you, you are actually you are forced to have supersymmetry to introduce this term with a, with a given ms squared. Now, what we also did, we monitored the, sp uh, the spatial average or this value of ms squared, this is roughly the one I gave you before, we also calculate the expectation value of the spatial average of phi squared. So uh, this is, you know, some 
histogram, if you want, but more interesting is probably this one, where uh, this is the expectation value of the spatial average of phi squared, and the, the relevant MS is around here where we have to do our calculation, critical one. And even for M equals zero, I mean, this we already uh, realized a year ago, uh, uh, it's uh, sort of published, we, we didn't see a runaway of the phi in the flat directions. Yeah. The flat directions are stabilized in this uh, formulation in a very nice way. I mean, that's no problem. Okay. So let's come a little bit to the fine tuning. So I mentioned phi squared is a relevant operator, so we did some fine tuning on this ms squared. Uh, but we know the continuum value very accurately uh, from a one loop calculation. Uh, but this may be not the optimal choice on a, on a, on a, on a finite lattice. This is a continuum result. So we did simulations on, in a grid uh, between 0.5 and 0.8. And uh, what we found that the word identity, the violation of the word identity, is very insensitive, amazingly. I don't understand really why to this scalar mass. Okay. Um, so we took then this mass close to this, uh, this, uh, this uh, one loop result. And again, I mean, we checked that it, the results do not depend sensitively on the value of this mass. So again, I mentioned already, we fine tune MF to come close to the continuum limit. So what we did here, we, uh, we find this, this fine tuned critical mass on a finite lattice, on a, on a discrete lattice. For example, by, say, by uh, imposing that the pi mass, which should be zero in the continuum limit, the continuum limit should be as small as possible. Okay, that, that's, that's one way to, to determine the critical uh, mass, fermion mass, or equivalent the critical hopping parameter. Another way to do it is by looking at the susceptibility of chi, chi yeah? lower parameter. And this is a two values, okay? And um, we then uh, checked actually further um, numbers, and finally we ended up with this is sort of other better results um, by doing different extrapolation and looking for high squared, for example. So in the following, we will use this criteria, minimizing the pion mass to, uh, to sample the uh, to find the supersomatic point. Yeah. This is regarding the statement that the word entities are insensitive to this mass. It is near this uh, this point where we the continuum uh, value of MS, yes. But uh, but uh, if you calculate it from the continuum, what do you get? Oh, the continuum is, is because it's a uh, super renormalized theory. You do this one loop res uh, uh, calculation, and then you that is the, where the supersymmetric point is. So that, that's known. That has been done by other people. It yeah. has repeated it for Wilson fermions, so to say. Yeah, but but you can calculate the sensitivity to MS from the continuum theory. Uh, numerically. Uh, can't you calculate it from the continuum theory? Just uh, from yeah, one loop. Uh, well, we could do, but since we are a bit away from one loop, I think I didn't see the point. I mean, uh -huh. but yeah, but, but but what I'm saying is, that, so you can ask, you know, like uh, from the continuum theory, do you expect it to be sensitive? Ah, uh, we didn't do that. Yeah, yeah that's maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even if you do one loop, we are not sure. Um, good. Um, so we did uh, extrapolation to the continuum of this, 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 uh, this uh, the mass of the, of the pion, um, and this is, uh, you know, what the fitting function. So what we ended up is this value for the, for the uh, pion mass, 0 0.018, it should be zero, right? Um, we used now a different, uh, because we don't have a really good idea how to interpolate this as square root of beta, then we end up with uh, plus 0 0.01. So it's certainly consistent. Uh, so we have uncertainty because how to extrapolate exactly. It's consistent that we have a, a, this restoration of supersymmetry. So now finally the scale setting, uh, we calculated the, the, um, the um, static potential. Here I show you the result uh, for beta to 17. So the continuum is uh, beta going large. Uh, and uh, went to the critical MF, close to the supersymmetric point. And then, of course, using the usual summer scale, you can relate now the, uh, you can uh, set the scale. And so then you know, uh, you know, for, for given beta, you know then, uh, and key G, G, which you put into your simulation, you know what is the lattice distance. Just to give a number, we use the scale of QCD. Because this is a dimensional reduction of super QCD, maybe not completely crazy. Okay, so 
Now, uh, I show you a little bit of dependence on the fermion mass um, uh, of the different quantities, but what the, what the really upshot, so the different beta closer and closer to the continuum. And what we then calculated from this simulation is the product of beta a squared. And then we got this number for different lattices, for different betas, which is completely consistent uh, with the G, the dimensionful G is not renormalized. So this tells us that we are not too far from the continuum limit. So the numbers are really impressive, I would say. After all, it's a two-dimensional theory, we should be better than in four dimensions. Okay, so this is, uh, well, this is technicalities. We have had to use, of course, some smearing uh, to improve the, um, the pre uh, for, well, signal to noise ratio. And so the next thing we looked at is uh, the water densities. I showed you these three water densities in the continuum. We go to the lattice. Of course, then the water densities become the uh, Schwinger Dyson equations because the action is not invariant anymore. Some people call it lattice water densities. Uh, so you get corrections to the water identities, and uh, you can then look at them. How much time? I, I shouldn't miss them. The yeah, important part. Four minutes. Ah, okay. So these are the three water identities. Um, you should look at the scale. So this is a continuum result, right? Which is known as three half, uh, zero, and three. And uh, we are roughly, typically one percent close to the critical value because you have to tune to the critical fermionic mass. So you should read it off at this point here. That is how the water identities change if you go away, the violation of the water identities will go from the critical, away from the critical value. Okay, so here are the water identities. Um, here is for the, for the smallest, uh, the, the finest lattice, you get these values, and these are the theoretical value, uh, which we know. And you see, for example, the, the numbers are not too bad, and especially I didn't really draw the continuum interpolation. Everything is very fine up to W3, which seems to approach the continuum limit very slowly. We don't know why. Okay, spectrum of bound states. Uh, well, that's a tricky issue. You have to make many limits in principle. Large lattice, tuning to the supersymmetric, well, I shouldn't say supersymmetric, but close to the supersymmetric point, and finally making to the continuum limit. That is the order where you proceed. Mm -hmm. So the volume, dip, so in the final volume, the masses uh, get finite size corrections. Uh, we have this exponential behavior, going back to Gernot, Münster, and uh, Fischer, um, where L0 is a scale uh, where finite size effects become important. Huh? And so if you have the lightest particle, which happens to be the eta meson, this L0 then is identified with the Compton wavelengths of this particle up to factor two, I guess. Um, so that is then the L0, which goes into the finest case uh, size analysis. So then, of course, we only should consider masses which are above this, uh, this uh, limit given by the finite lattice size. Or in other words, we have to take anthropic lattices that we always were uh, above this bound. Okay. So we always did simulations slightly above the critical value of the cropping parameter, so we never had any sign problem, and then extrapolated to the supersomatic limit, that is this one here. And that's, for example, what you get on lattice, uh, no, this actually is not correct, this was on the lattice with 96 in the time direction and 48 in the spatial direction. So these are uh, the masses, and uh, these are the extrapolation, if you want, to the uh, large lattice volumes. Okay, and we always use the critical fermionic mass. And this is a fit by this exponential function. No. This is this, this uh, small window. So the prediction would be uh, for these values of parameters, this, uh, for this value of kappa. And then if you cruise kappa, you come closer to the, to the supersymmetric point, you get this value. So these are the dimensionless quantities, I should say. And the same you do now with. Uh, uh, Going even closer and closer to the critical, uh, critical kappa, and then it goes down. And this is actually the, the limit given by the lattice size. So we should stay above this one, so we still would trust uh, this value here. We, we will a bit, must be careful. Also, the extrapolation works very nicely, as you see. Okay. Now, these are the uh, the correlators of the pion, the eta meson, and the f meson. Now, the P pion and the eta are the red and the green. They are on top of each other. And the F meson has, you know, you can see these tails of the two-point function. 
And again, uh, these are for different values of uh, kappas. So that what we see, the first message that the pion, this sort of artificial particle we introduced to test for supersymmetry, has the same mass as the eta. And secondly, if we increase kappa and come closer to the supersymmetric point, then also the f comes close to the masses of these two particles. So it seems they want to build a multiplet. And actually, if you think, remember the table at the beginning, uh, at the beginning, the eta and the f, they should be in this uh, uh, Yankielovich uh, Veneziano multiplet. And we see how they approach each other, the masses. Uh, and we check that the difference is actually disconnected parts, and they're extremely small in this case. Okay, so this mean, also means that the eta meson vanishes in the chiral limit because the pion mass must vanish in the, in the chiral limit. The first prediction is and, uh, that we have the pion becoming massless, we have the eta becoming massless, and we have the F particle becoming, meson becoming massless. So now we did, then, of course, a, a careful analysis. We also could extract the, the masses of the excited states in these channels. And what you see here, this is for, for different, let me see now, for different um, betas. So the left is as close to the continuum as we could come. And so from right to left, you come closer to the continuum. And going to the left, you come to the supersymmetric point, where the, the fermion mass is, is fine-tuned from below. And what you see again, the, 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 uh, the pi and the eta sit on top of each other, always, and the f particles finally falls into the same multiplet as the eta and the pi. Okay, so that's, that's clearly uh, established that uh, the, the f and the, the, uh, the, the eta are in the same multiplet, at least concerning the mass. Now for the excited states, the error bars are a bit larger, but it also seems that the uh, the, uh, the, the eta prime, f prime, and pi prime fall in the same multiplet. So we have seen a multi sub super multiplet, at least the mesons, and the first excited levels. And so, so these are these two uh, part of the super multiplet. So this looks extremely nice. But um, now you look for the Gluino glue ball. This operator, so we did a, again an analysis. Now here the smearing was very important. This is a very noisy operator. So we had to study the, depending on the smearing step, and unfortunately, it really depends on the, on the smearing. And you could do to make some interpolation. So what we, I should say, there are two of these particle states, uh, the, uh, different parities, and they should in principle have the same mass because parity is not broken. So what we find in the extrapolation is these two masses. So they're still off by 15%, which in this high position calculation is not very satisfactory. I mean, we are working on the percent level. Right? Okay, so there's an indication that these two masses, uh, uh, for the, you know, two parity states have the same mass, and they should be the same multiplet as expected. But again, there's a 15% uh, inaccuracy. Okay, and we get the infinite volume extrapolation is uh, 0.251, which is actually the mass of the excited mesons, very nearby. So it seems that this, Blue, you know, blue, blue ball uh, is a member of the multiplet of the excited mesons. So what we have not seen is a light particle with the same quantum numbers. But the explanation we have at the moment that we just didn't go far enough to see the tail. Right? If you have two short distances, you cannot really disentangle the excited states from the, from the low-lying state. We need some further analysis. It must be around. But honestly, we have seen such the excited state, which falls into the multiplet of these excited mesons. Okay, now, very shortly, glue ball and scalar balls. Uh, these are the second multiplet. So this is a typical picture of the two-point function um, of the, I think it was a glue scalar ball. So what happens is that they completely decorrelate. So the the two-point function is essentially zero everywhere, or constant, which means there's no correlation which means uh, uh, it decouples from the system. We were a bit worried about this one, but then, of course, you should remember that in pure QCD2, which is not a dynamical theory, the same happens. So we compared the two-point functions in the pure Young-Mills theory, two-dimensional, which is non-dynamical, to this theory, and I should say that the correct are the red points. And the other one we get by smearing. By smearing, of course, you enlarge, so to say, the, the overlap between the sink and the sources, and artificially you produce a, a slope becomes less. Okay. 
We have done many analyses here. That the conclusion finally is essentially the two-point function is a constant value at zero and one, or n and n minus one, and then it drops to zero. So this multiplet in two dimensions decouples from your system. So it's completely different to the four-dimensional system. And there's some explanation to that. Okay, so let me come to the summary. Um, I think I've convinced you there's no sign problem. That's similar to the Q-exact formulation. The results seem to be insensitive to the, well, they are in the simulation insensitive to the scalar mass near the value which we know from uh, lattice perturbation theory. Uh, we have seen SUSI restoration by tuning the pion mass. It indeed goes to zero within error bars, and we always, in each finite lattice size, we fine tune the pion mass to get as close to the SUSI point as we can. The spectrum is related, but it's different to the four dimensional mother theory. There's a massless dimensionally reduced uh, Veneziano Jankelovic multiplet. The second multiplet uh, decouples from the spectrum. Um, there's one missing light green or glue ball. Uh, I'm sorry, I would like to show you also this state to fit nice into the massless multiplet, but uh, so far we haven't seen it. Thank you very much. Questions? So the, the claim is there is a massless multiple in this theory. Um, that surprises me at first glance. I would have guessed it was gapped. It's not obviously a conformal field theory. Yeah. Uh, do you have any comments about that? What well, actually, the origin of the? I've already a lot about a lot about it, but my, from my experience from from other theories, you know, two dimensional gauge theories, it matter. You always have uh, massless states, massless, and. Uh, I think we should think about it. That, you know, that the results are so convincing. I think there's no way out. It's there. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any symmetry reasons and no obvious, you know, like, uh, uh, I don't know, what you know from quantum field theory. But uh, yeah, very, very interesting. I agree. It's very non true. Not what one would have expected at all. Actually. Yeah. It would be really very nice if you could do it. Uh, you know, you have the code. You, do, you rerun the simulation for your uh, deformed uh, simulation and, and calculate these masses. Want to make a little bit of advertisement? I mean, you should look at these models from, from the spectrum, at least of this model, from different formulations. Um, just to comment, um, maybe uh, this fermionic particle that you are missing is not a glue ball. Maybe it's baryonic operators. So, um, be an explanation for this missing. We should discuss it. I mean, we have to yeah. go to the list of all operators, interpolating operators, what we have in mind there. Yeah. Without any, with any, any glue content, you say. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you have already mentioned, but can you say anything about possible SUSI breaking or absence of SUSI breaking, spontaneous breaking? We haven't seen any SUSI breaking. No. Yeah. It's not spontaneously broken. He seems to agree with, with uh, you yeah. uh, his uh, reason. Yes. Yeah, but, but he's also, also <laughs> consistent with yeah. Susie bro breaking Susie as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we haven't seen any sign of super okay. breaking. Right. Yeah. Uh, just a technical uh, remark, uh, technical question actually. Have you attempted uh, any, um, any variation or calculation on the smearing uh, that you have done? Or are there results from single? Meeting yeah. level. Yeah. So you see that uh, the, the number of states is actually not very big, which we have to look at. And uh, actually, we did some variation calculation. Uh, so we spent lots of time on the smearing. Uh, maybe you have seen it. Different types of smearing for different fields uh, because it was really noising the correlators. But uh, here, the, you know, the, the, the number of operators is really small compared to you know, four dimensional gauge theories. So you don't get too much by variational, variational answers. Thank you. Um, maybe one more question. So you mentioned that uh, some operators are, are, are decoupled from uh, theory. So, yeah. so uh, are these operators uh, supersymmetric invariant operators? So, so, yeah, yeah. So, so you mentioned that yeah, uh, some operators decoupled. So, so, so are these operators uh, supersymmetric invariant? Uh, yeah, these are something that, yeah. There are three states of post three states, yeah, yeah. Are, of course, member of a sub, a super multiplet. Super multiplet. Yeah. 
but the uh, the but the yeah uh, chiral, uh, chiral uh, but the these states itself uh, uh, is, is not supersymmetric invariant in uh, multiple homotopy. Yes, yes. Again, I mean, two dimensions is different, as you know, pure Young Mills theory are sort of. That the gauge field has no degrees of freedom, uh, propagating degrees of freedom. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Biff.